Good evening. It is being held as an historic day in the mountains of eastern Kentucky. Nearly 4,000 people turned out to watch as state fish and wildlife officials released seven elk into the woods. This is a story about the knockout punch from the underdog. It's a story about the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. It's about family and traditions, and it's about righting the wrongs of our past. It's a story about accomplishing what some say was impossible. And for me, it's a once in a lifetime chance to experience all of it. It's like hunting elk in Vietnam. It's thick and it's nasty and it's hot and the mosquitoes are horrible. Hunting elk in Kentucky is not easy. No matter who you are. That's so crazy, oh my God. No matter what you want your life to be, you're gonna be a star. He's coming in hot through the gap. <laughs> You did a good job with that. Here are two little known facts about Kentucky. 95% of all bourbon is produced in Kentucky. The Bluegrass State also has the biggest elk herd east of the Mississippi, which is interesting because just up until about 20 years ago, the eastern elk was extinct. The reintroduction of these elk has been one of the great conservation success stories of our time, and the elk in Kentucky are in huntable numbers. But getting one of those elk tags is like getting a Willy Wonka golden ticket. Somehow, I managed to score one, and now I'm in Kentucky to hunt elk. My guide through this adventure will be Trinity Shepherd. Trinity has hunted these hills his entire life, and the night I arrive, he and I set up camp and get ready for the first morning's hunt. You ever have one of those moments where you're a complete idiot? This morning I had one of those. I'm on a rifle hunt in Kentucky, like my dream hunt, and I didn't have any hunter orange with me. I forgot it all at home. Luckily, Trinity has a 2XL vest or an XL vest, this uh, bank robber mask. I may not have a stylish orange, but I've got something. Damn it. I'm hunting the area in and around Martin County, Kentucky. And in this part of the world, coal is by far the biggest resource. For the families of this area, the coal mines have constituted a way of life for generations. Today, the coal industry is not as robust as it has been in the past, but there is now something else in these hills that has inspired and helped many of the locals, and that is its elk herd. Trinity and I hiked our butts off on day one with no luck, but we did have fun. The elk might not be here, but at least I look good. Aluma Trailers. Where every trip and load is valued. Ren and Ivy Sporting and Travel Gear. Ren and Ivy, leave a legacy. Waypoint Aviation, located at historic Lunkin Field, a premier FBO with a hometown field. If you're flying to Cincinnati, choose Waypoint. After more than a century, elk are once again roaming the recreation area. It's a project we could not have undertaken without the $900,000 commitment from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Although there were tons of people that were all for elk being reintroduced into Kentucky, many farmers in Kentucky were against this plan. They feared that elk would destroy their crops and damage valuable pasture land. The solution were the coal mines of eastern Kentucky. When strip mining is finished in an area, the cleared land is replanted in prairie grasses, and the nourishment of these lush green meadows, combined with the thick hills and hollers that surround them, created prime habitat not only for elk, but for dozens of other species. And so several counties of this area in eastern Kentucky were chosen to be the new home of Kentucky's new elk herd. It all started with seven elk being released in front of thousands of people. And today, the elk of Kentucky have turned into a sustainable resource that numbers over 10,000. On the second morning of our hunt, Trinity and I finally get a bull to bugle. Trinity sets up behind me and starts calling. And me and my brand new blaze orange hat, well, we get set up too. When this young bull finally shows himself, 
he's far from the giants that these hills have the potential for. But this is public land, and he is definitely tempting me. From this angle, I have no shot. Then the wind swirls, and so does he. I stand up for a better vantage point. Trinity keeps calling. This guy is looking for love, and he comes back. And then he sees my big orange butt standing there. One more second. That's all I needed. Would I have shot this bull? You're damn right I would have. And I'm not afraid to admit it. I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing that he went away. I'd have been happy with that, that, that bull. That was awesome. I just game. didn't have a shot. Yeah. This guy crawls out, calling all the way like a sweet cow you are. That's right. Yeah. That must have sound real pretty. <laughs> you sound real pretty. Nothing works up an appetite like a good morning of hunting. And back at camp, we're joined by my good buddy, Craig, who also is hunting elk in this area. We are in the middle of nowhere, in tents, so it's up to us to cook the food, which ironically is one of my favorite parts of this kind of hunting. I mean, honestly, what says backcountry hunting camp better than cooking up a big old manly breakfast and then sitting and wolfing it all down with one of your best buddies? For me, that's what it's all about. Being out here in the middle of nowhere with no cell service and good friends. That night, Trinity and I sat down by the fire and I get a chance to learn more about what it means to grow up in these hills. You know, I've always played music. You don't have music, you have these hills. You know, I was brought up in the outdoors ever since I was six years old. And a lot of people look at the outdoors, look at hunting, fishing, camping, all the stuff that comes with it as a hobby. It's not a hobby for me, it's a way of life. It's always been a way of family. It's always been a way of tradition and culture. If it weren't for coal, what would this area be like? You know, I can't imagine in Eastern Kentucky without coal mining. I always tell everybody I cut my teeth on a block of coal. My great grandfather, my grandfather, my dad, all were coal miners. And, and my dad always worked real hard to try to keep me out of that. You know, not because he wasn't proud of it. Because it's a rough life. It's a rough life, and he wanted better for his son. Cole, not just a rough way of life, but a rough, hard, dirty life. Coal mining in Kentucky began in 1820 when the first commercial coal mine opened in the western coal fields of Muhlenberg County. It wasn't until 1900 that the eastern coal field began to be mined in Floyd County. The coal mining industry in this part of the world experienced rises and falls through most of the early to mid 20th century. The two world wars made for periods of boom. Following World War II, the drive towards mechanization and the Korean War pushed the industry even higher. However, American railroads and households soon began shifting from coal to oil and gas for their energy needs, and the industry yet again experienced a downturn. Today, though it's experienced periods of boom, heavy regulations have hit the coal industry here hard. And when that happens, the families that depend on those coal mines, they get hit worst of all. Coal mining, our cash crop, if you would, um, has also been a way of life. You know, it's been something that's been passed down from father to son, father to son. So people take pride in that. The elk have offered a, a whole nother kind of industry in a way. It's a new resource for people. It's a new way of life. We've been given a second chance with this natural resource. We messed up the first time. We've got a second chance to make sure we don't do that again. That feels good. Yeah, it feels real good. Yeah. It's the third day in Kentucky. A little bit discouraged, honestly. It can always turn any day. After four days of hunting elk in Kentucky, it's like hunting elk in Vietnam. It's thick and it's nasty and it's hot and the mosquitoes are horrible. We have literally been invaded by stink bugs. Why here at our camp is if we haven't had enough trouble with the elk have been completely overrun by stink bugs. I can't catch a break. I've been in the heart of Kentucky coal country hunting for almost five days. So I decide to take a break and shift gears. I meet Paul Horn of Booth Energy and Paul has agreed to take me down in one of their coal mines. 
But first, I have to go to school. Note the information that follows. It may someday save your life. It just got serious. It's no secret that going miles underneath the ground can be dangerous. So they're trying to teach me what to do in the case of an emergency. And as you can see, I'm treating that about as seriously as I treated things back in high school, which for the record normally got me into detention. Do you have this in a more fashionable model? I'm not a big fan of blue. Do you have like orange? Orange and camo? The one that you really use be black. Well, that's good to know because I, I can't be seen with this. Can I take these home with me? Yeah, you can have them. They'll be yours. <sighs> this guy's like, Man, listen to me. This is serious stuff. Everybody's like, "Hey, go down into mine. This will be. It'll be great." He didn't. I didn't realize I was in knocking on death's door here. This is a man door, Nick. This is what you'll travel through to go from an intake air course to a neutral air course, or from a neutral air course to a return air course. Just to keep everything isolated. Keep everything isolated. Right here's what on the lifeline. This is what you're gonna find if you're on the section. We had a problem. We and the mines is getting smoky or whatever. Yeah. I'm not sure I understood any of that, but here I go. When we climb through the man door, the whole room is filled with smoke. The cones are smaller than I thought they'd be. And I feel around to find the cones on the line. Smaller than the picture. Pretty simple. So why am I doing all this? Well, just in case something bad happens while I'm in the mine, I need to know how to get the hell out of it. Well, I live to fight another day. And now, I know I can make it through 20 feet of mine. I just hope I can make it through two miles of mine. <laughs> Here's a bespoke cover haul to wire. There are three eight, one size fits all. One size fits all. Yeah. Although it does say three XL right there, which one size fits all means it's really damn big. <laughs> yeah, what that means. But I could fit my wife in here too. I get duded up, suited up, tied up, taped up, buckled up. But hey, at least I won't get dirty. What am I doing? I uh, do not feel very cool right now. But you're safe. But I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> coal mining ain't for the sexy or the cool, right? Right. Or maybe for the cool but not the sexy. I mean, I don't want to not. I don't want to call you not cool. You probably call us a whole lot. Time you get done today. <laughs> Nothing makes you feel more cool than walking into a badass scenario with a bunch of grizzled guys. Until you realize that you have a big white suit on and everybody else doesn't. Then you just feel like you stick out like a sore thumb. Which is probably by design. Because after all, even though it's safer than ever, coal mining is still very dangerous. These guys are veterans with decades of experience. And I, well, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And if I'm honest, I'm really nervous. There are times in your life where you know you're out of your comfort zone. I'm sitting next to this fine gentleman, David, here in my white overalls. I know that this is one of them. I'm going down in a coal mine. I'm from Minnesota. I'm not supposed to be going down in coal mines. I love you, Mom. If I don't make it, I love you. I'm getting ready to head underground with some of the toughest people on the planet into some of the most formidable work conditions there are. And it doesn't take me long to realize that whatever training they gave me has not prepared me for what I'm feeling. That's kind of intimidating. As we start to head down the mine shaft, the doors behind us close and seal us off from the rest of the world. And just like the Energizer Bunny, we keep going and going and going. The active part of these slope mines can be miles back and hundreds of feet down. There were tunnels everywhere you looked, but only one thing stayed the same. The only lights down here were the ones on our heads. It's crazy. We're back in here. How far? Uh, around 3,500 feet. So we're pushing a mile back in here. When you start to realize how far down in here you are and the fact that there is zero light, it's a little disconcerting. I mean, we're talking zero light. Like, watch this. That's a little freaky. <laughs> it's a good thing I got an old salty veteran with me. As we make it into the work area, I start to learn a few things. These guys mine about 5,500 tons of raw material from this mine a day. Down around, we're holding out, we never give. Just getting down here is a job all by itself. A lot of the guys I met started this job right out of high school. Their dads worked down here, and so did their granddads. They work hard, and they take care of each other. And they all look up to my new buddy, David. We 
He's been down here for nearly 40 years. And the more I talk to him about the life of a miner, I start to think that maybe he didn't choose it. Instead, it chose him. The generations of people that have been down here. Did your grandfathers or fathers or anything work down here? My father worked in the mines. My grandfather, as did my great-grandfather. Oh, so you've heard some stories then? Yeah. You know, I could hear them talk about hand loading back in the up into the 50s. Were they literally like pickaxing it down yeah. here? Yeah. Are your kids down here too? I've got one son works down there, yeah. So that's five generations of people. Yeah. You were right out of high school? Yeah. Going, coming into this? Probably all of them straight out of high school? This is back-breaking hard work. Have you ever thought about doing anything different? Mm, don't know nothing different. That's, that's all I've ever done. I like it. Enjoy it. Most of these people I've grown up around all my life, I've known them. You went from being a high schooler to the boss? Yeah. Did you ever see that coming? No. <laughs> you're, still, you're still thinking about it like, I can't believe they put me in charge? Yeah. <laughs> you're a tougher man than I am, I can no, tell you I that much. I don't know about that. That's a man. I'm just a guy in a white suit. There's roughing it. And then there's roughing it with Craig. Craig brings a generator, a Keurig, some Founding Fathers coffee. He's got a giant tent with another giant tent over it. He even brought way more dish soap than he needs. You know, this is day 10, <laughs> and you're wet and cold. You want coffee? I do want coffee. It's been raining all day, and Craig just shot a bowl, nice. so I'll, I'll be nice to him. Yep, that's right. After 10 days of hard public land hunting, Craig went out and shot himself a big old Kentucky bull. And being the southern gentleman that Trinity is, he's offered to stay in camp and help Craig get elbows deep and you know what. And that finds me leaving camp solo to guide myself on today's hunt. I've got a bull bugling right over here three, four hundred yards just down the, the holler here. Finally. <laughs> As you've seen, this Kentucky elk hunt has not been easy. In six days of hunting, I've only heard and seen just one bull. So you can imagine my excitement when I heard that bull bugle back to me. And then I really got excited when I looked over the hill and saw this cow. And then, hiding behind a tree, I found the bull. I was amazed that this tough old guy could take a 200 grain federal premium straight to the boiler maker and keep walking. He's still right there. Six days of grinding. It's been hot. Mosquitoes, thorns. I'm in Kentucky. I just shot an elk in Kentucky. Not Idaho, not Montana, not Wyoming. Kentucky. I am rarely the speechless type, but I am at a loss for words right now. I mean, this has been the most incredible experience. It's been tough. It's been a tough hunt, but it's nothing compared to the, the journey these elk have been on. I mean, we wiped them completely out in the 1800s, and now we brought them back and the people here and the stories of these hills and these haulers and the culture and everything, it's, I think it's one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. Think about this for a second. I just shot a bull that could very possibly be a direct descendant of one of those original seven elk that were released in 1997. Suddenly, I've become a part of this Kentucky story too. What have I learned on my East Kentucky journey? Well, for one thing, these elk have made a big impact on the people here. I've also seen that there is a way of life that is changing before our eyes. It feeds and clothes families. 
and for many, it's the only way of life they know. It's passed down through generations, from father to son, and it keeps them grounded and gives them a feeling of pride and accomplishment. Inevitably, time and technology changes everything, and the life of a coal miner is no exception. Regardless of where things are headed, I've learned that the people that work in these mines have a dirty, hard, back-breaking job. And with that said, they're also some of the most friendly, gracious, positive, and humble people I've ever met. And I can tell you this, if just a little bit of Eastern Kentucky could rub off on the rest of the world, well then that world would be a better place to live. <laughs> a miner's gotta eat, right? I, of all the things I expected to see in a mine, a microwave was not one of them. That's awesome. Some places are so vast that they evoke a sense of, well, it's hard to explain. I could do the usual thing and go on and on about the beautiful yet deadly place this is, or the sense of adventure you feel when you cross the border straight into no man's land. And while all those things are true, let's cut to the chase. These dusty hills are in the middle of the Mexican desert. And this, my friends, is the middle of drug cartel country and a staging area for border crossings. And in a way, these hills, they're full of ghosts and their signs are everywhere. From the Mexican cartels and desperate people willing to risk it all for a better life to a tiny white-tailed deer they call the gray ghost. There is a lot hiding in these hills. So why, you ask, am I headed smack dab in the middle of all of this? Well, I'm still trying to figure that out for myself. I made it to Tucson, Arizona. All my bags are here, my gun's here. My phone starts blowing up. My mom, my grandma, my dad, my wife, everybody telling me to be careful, be careful. Because I'm going to Mexico and everybody's worried about me. Maybe they know something I don't. Maybe I'm just stupid. You know what they say, stupid is as stupid does. No matter who you are. That's so crazy, oh my God. No matter what you want your life to be. He's coming in hot through the gap. <laughs> you did a good job with that. Everyone knows about Mexico. They know the sounds and the smells and the tastes of this country. The drinks of tequila, margaritas, and Mexican beer. Mexico is famous for its tough people and even more famous for its vacation destinations. And more recently, it's become known as a place of uncertainty and danger. Everyone has an image of what Mexico is. Heck, for some, it only means a chihuahua they know from a commercial on TV. What most people don't know about Mexico is that it is full of hunting opportunity. And those opportunities have me back in Mexico with my good buddy Matt Woodward of Borderland Adventures. And crossing the border with Matt is like getting into a time machine and driving straight into the past. We are officially in Mexico. We just checked uh, our guns in with the military. It's crazy the change. You go over the border and instantly it's third world and dirt roads and I mean we're talking about within a hundred yards. This is historically you know a little bit of drug cartel country. I mean that's sure, safe to say right? Yeah and, we're in the heart of it. Yeah. And we're 30 days into a government shutdown right now and the guy for the military was just telling us that actually maybe it's made a difference you know all this attention down here at the border and the drug cartels have actually moved away from here for a little while which is fine with me. I'm like kind of against the drug cartel thing. If I'm gonna be in Mexico, I'd rather the drug cartel not be, be here. Be somewhere else. <laughs> I'd be somewhere else, exactly. So, our first stroke of good luck, no drug cartels. Now, since the drug cartels weren't around, we thought we'd visit a local restaurant and drink a cold one. A cold Coca-Cola, that is. And what goes well with that? You guessed it. Tacos, real tacos, in Mexico. Once our bellies are full, we head out the door, get back on the road, and head to hunting camp.
Now, if you know anything about me, you know that I'm a sucker for history. My favorite part of traveling is getting a glimpse into the past. And this small house that we're staying at offers exactly that. On 180,000 acres of ranch, this is the main house. Built at the turn of the last century, this place was literally built by hand with nothing but the stones picked up from the land that we'll be hunting on. When I see places like this, I can't help but think of the stories and the people who came before us and made so much with so little. This place is like magical. It's like stepping back in time. What year was this built in? 1905. Every single stone by hand in here, picked from the desert. And all from the wash yard below us. Unbelievable. There's coos in these hills. The hills are alive with the clashing of antlers. Aluma Trailers. Where every trip and load is valued. Ren and Ivy Sporting and Travel Gear. Ren and Ivy, leave a legacy. Waypoint Aviation, located at historic Lunkin Field, a premier FBO with a hometown field. If you're flying to Cincinnati, choose Waypoint. The Borderlands, miles of hills and brush as far as the eye can see. And in this kind of country, after traveling this far, you better make sure your rifle is spot on. Now we're talking. Zeroed, the sun's going down. In Africa, they call it a sundowner. Here it's just Cerveza. That's all I care about. Tomorrow is Ku's Deer Day. Like Christmas Day, only better. Most people have no idea what a Ku's Deer is. Discovered by Dr. Elliot Ku's in the 1860s, the Ku's Deer is just like the white tail that you've been hunting your whole life, only smaller. They live in the deserts of Mexico, Arizona, and New Mexico. The coos deer is basically the munchkin of the whitetail world. Think I'm kidding? Check this out. This is a Boone and Crockett whitetail deer. And this is a Boone and Crockett coos deer. Seriously, that is a coos deer of a lifetime. Now, hunting a coos deer is nothing like hunting their corn-fed cousins. And I can't wait to get started. In life, we are presented with a never-ending string of choices. Some easy, and some more difficult. A lesson my dad taught me very young has proven itself time and time again. The hard choice is usually the right one. Nothing worth anything comes without work. And that's always easier said than done. Knowing that doesn't make the choice any easier. And in my first morning in Mexico, I was faced with one of those choices. We spotted a big coos deer over here. It's the first morning, like the first hour of the first morning. And we've spotted a borderline booner already. I'm gonna be honest with you, it looks pretty damn big to me, man. <laughs> first morning, that's a tempting deer. <sighs> What's the old adage? I don't like that adage. You don't like that adage? Never leave on the first day what you would shoot on the last. That, that has never made any lick of sense to me. Hey, what's the new adage? Just do what Matt says. That book's safe today. The rest of my first afternoon hunting in Mexico, we put on some serious miles on foot through some difficult terrain. This ranch is 180,000 acres, and finding a deer that is the size of a large dog in all of it is like finding a needle in a haystack. Needless to say, you do a lot of hiking and even more glassing. And aside from the buck we spotted this morning, the only thing we saw was just how big of a piece of habitat this place is. When somebody says you have a 180,000 acre ranch, it's not hard if you say it fast, you know, until you actually put eyes on what that means. When we're talking about not over there, we're talking about over the next mountain range. It's crazy. Unbelievable.
Every hunt has those moments that stay with you. Sometimes it happens in the quiet hours before dawn. You might have felt it the very first time you went hunting with your grandpa or your dad. A perfect moment that you try to hold on to and recreate for the rest of your life. And if we're lucky, we stumble upon something that triggers that feeling for just a moment. Sometimes in places like this, I still get that feeling from time to time. But out here in this desert, I could feel something else. Something that nags at you like an itch you can't scratch. That there's more here than meets the eye. Something just underneath the surface. As beautiful as this place is, it is equally as dangerous. And that afternoon, we were slapped right in the face with a stark reminder of exactly that. Drug running is a serious problem here, and one that the Mexican military takes very seriously. I consider myself the kind of guy who's comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Well, that is until a Hummer with seven fully armed bad hombres shows up with automatic weapons. Then I'm uncomfortable. It's situations like these that you begin to appreciate Matt's 20 plus years of outfitting down here. The extent of my Spanish is mas cerveza por favor. And let's just say that in this situation, a failure to communicate is not an option. There's something a little disconcerting about a Humvee full of guys that you can not speak their language that all have guns. You did a good job with that. <laughs> that was crazy. So they're looking for drug runners. Yeah. Right? Just on the general patrol, just covering ground, covering all this country. Yeah. Did he ask you if he'd seen anything? No, not at all. Just he just wanted to no. know about our gun and that no, was it. We'd, we'd seen any deer. Yeah. yeah. So that was about it. Want to check the gun permit? They just want to see our permit and away they go. Yeah. That's... For about 60 seconds, two minutes maybe. I don't know, maybe for a couple minutes and on their way. Yeah, it made me pucker up a little bit, I'll admit. <laughs> That's pretty cool. We're hunting in the province of Sonora, Mexico, and it shares the majority of its border with the U.S. state of Arizona. This area is significant because it's full of Mexicans trying to cross this border. Nowadays, you can't turn on the news without hearing the words border or wall. And often, when you hear those words, the headlines are talking about this area right here. It's an issue that has polarized our country. People are protesting everywhere for and against border wall. Jobs, illegal and legal immigration that strike at the core of our country's values and both human and constitutional rights. We are hunting only 20 miles south of the border. And as we hunt on, Matt and I stumble upon something that is a stark reminder of what people are willing to go through to get across that border. This is a, it's been here for a while, obviously. This one's in pretty bad shape, but this is just one of the backpacks uh, from one of the immigrants. It's point just point a time, cheap backpack. Yeah, it, just, is this common? Like, yeah, very common, very common. Most of them are carrying a backpack, and most of them in this area particularly are in this camo pattern. It's kind of a generic camo pattern. You know, when I look around here and I think about how difficult it is for us to hike through, here with good insulation and good shoes and all that stuff i picture somebody making this trip with what nothing but a backpack maybe a little bit of food water, and some water food, yeah mm -hmm. and pretty some, brutal trip yeah absolutely i mean people they die doing that they do unfortunately uh it happens it seems to have more deaths on north of the border desperation kicks in once they've crossed the line here they're still and residents they're and they're just out on a hike country, right yeah, yeah. So but once they get over there then they get desperate get much more desperate over there over the course of a career i've ended up finding about five bodies over the last really? 20 years yeah yeah and that gives me goosebumps yeah. that's that's crazy i'm glad this isn't me It's now day five of my coos deer hunt in the Mexican desert. And while we've seen plenty of deer from afar, we haven't been able to close the deal. And I'm beginning to wonder if maybe I should have taken the opportunity that I had on day one. Today we're joined by Johnny, one of Matt's guides, and the three of us spend all day glassing. Frustration starts to set in, and then something almost providential happens. You know that burned out saying, when God closes one door, he usually opens a window? Or was it a door? Anyway, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that what happened that day was a big old opportunity presenting itself. I got a mule deer buck here, big mule deer buck. Big. Hold on a second. Here, check that out. That's a good buck, isn't it? That's a really big buck, Nick. We need to kill that buck, dude. He's Are you serious? Yeah, that's a big deer. He's gonna go over the top, though. 
He's going over. We gotta go get we gotta get moving guys. Okay. Let's load up guys and get get on this deer. Let's go. Suddenly, my coos deer hunt has turned into a mule deer hunt. Ironically, I've never shot a mule deer. I'm from Minnesota, so we positioned to get a shot at a buck of a lifetime. I am set up, I have a steady rest, and I'm ready to shoot. I have this buck in my sight, clear as day, but there's one small problem. He's gotta come down, I can't shoot him on the skyline like that. I don't take the oh, shot. Oh, damn it. Why, you ask? Well, the answer goes back to my hunter safety instructor when I was 12. Never shoot a bullet when you don't know where the bullet will go. This buck is skylined. And even though I know there's nothing but 180,000 acres on the other side of that ridge, technically, this is not an ethical shot. And I watch painfully as this giant buck walks over the hill. Matt, Johnny, and I run in the direction that the buck was headed. The bad news here is that he's disappeared over the hillside. The good news is that the reason for this is that he's following this girl, a hot doe that appears 150 yards in front of us. And heaven knows that no red-blooded male will ever get too far from a lady that's interested. If he takes two more steps, how far is he? Like 200? Shooting for 200 even. Got it, right in the shoulder. I got it, dude. dude. Right in the shoulder. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Awesome. Oh man. Nice. That's I cannot believe this. Literally my first mule deer of my life. In Mexico. Are you kidding me? Oh. On. Unbelievable. <laughs> I I don't even know what to say. What do you say to that? Not much to say, buddy. He's fantastic. Oh, I mean, as far as wild Sonoran mill deer go, this is about as good as it gets, isn't it? This is. This is fantastic. <laughs> Doesn't matter, he could be 120 inches and I I am beside myself. Unbelievable, thank you, brother. I'm the kind of guy that believes that life happens the way it's supposed to. I came here to hunt one thing and ended up with another. Some might call it luck, but I think it's more like my grandma used to say. That's just how the cookie crumbled. In machaca, dried meat, kind of their version of what you'd see in Africa. It's built on. It's only got salt on it. If you look real carefully, he's got some kind of coarse it looks salt like he's granules. Like kind of almost marinated it in a little bit of water and some salt. Kind of. Absolutely. Added a little bit of granular salt and uh, gonna dry it out here for a while. 
And uh, awesome. this will keep very well then. And they hang them in the shade over in the barn over there. And, and the last, cowboys, they last the all year. And uh, you rehydrate it. You've got your protein source right here. As you can see, the cowboys that live way out on this ranch wasted no time taking advantage of my kill. And neither did we. Myself and all the other hunters in camp sat down to share a cold cerveza, fresh mule deer, roasted green chilies, homemade tortillas, and a few laughs. And to me, that is what hunting is all about. It's about putting yourself outside of your element, culturally, physically, mentally. It's about adventure. For me, trips like this help put things back home in perspective. It reminds me that we're all stuck in this crazy journey together. It reminds me that we live in the greatest country on the face of the earth. And often, we take that for granted. Everything that you take for granted now or blessings first. And, and when you think about the journey that these people make and how horrible it is, it makes you feel really, really lucky for what we've got. I'd like to tell you that I have life all figured out, but this trip has proven that just when you think you know what's about to happen, the truth is that our fate and what actually occurs is decided by something way bigger than us. So sit back, enjoy the ride, or in my case, enjoy the fajitas. Canada, a country with tundra, forests, prairies, and rocky mountains. It has 3.5 million square miles of land, making it the second largest country by total area. Canada is known for hunting and fishing and all sorts of other activities. And one of those activities is the lovely sport of curling. All right, here we go. Now I may be in Canada to hunt, but I'm also here to do as the Canadians do. I mean, how hard can that be? No matter who you are. That's so crazy. Oh my god. No matter what you want your life to be. You're gonna be a star. He's coming in hot through the gap. Rolling like a VIP. Yeah. You're living like a rock star, baby. You did a good job with that. This isn't my first time in Alberta, but this is my first time hunting moose. And needless to say, I'm excited. I'm hunting at Northern Wilderness Outfitters with Donald McClanahan. It's our first morning out, and we weren't even five minutes into our hike before we had our first moose sighting. I walk over here and I'm like, oh, surely that's not a moose. I mean, that's crazy talk. We haven't been walking five minutes. There's a cow and a calf in the water right there, which I consider to be a good omen, or maybe that's the only damn moose we'll see the whole trip. The early history of Alberta is closely tied to the fur trade and all of the rivalries associated with it. Early on, this brought literal battles between English and French traders. While there were many animals associated with the fur trade, we came across one of the most important almost immediately, the beaver. And just on the other side of the river from that is an elk. Most people don't realize that there is a huge population of elk here. And ironically, I do have an elk tag, but I need to keep my eye on the prize. I'm here for moose, and that is where my focus will stay. At least for now, anyway. As you can see, we are stuck. Back from hunting. Got the truck stuck. Donald has friends in low places, so he called a friend who is now also stuck. We're stuck. Free at last. Now we can go hunt again. Trust me when I say this. Getting around in this part of the world is not easy and definitely comes with some troubles. To find animals in this cover, you have to put on a lot of miles. And on our second morning, we had an encounter that made all the hoofing we've done so far all worth it. That's a good way to start the morning right there. I tell you what, I've never been that close to a moose in my life. That was awesome. 
Some people would probably say that I overuse the word awesome. But for me, experiencing a close encounter with an animal that as an adult stands almost 7 feet at the shoulder and is 10 feet in length and it can weigh over 1,500 pounds? Well, if you ask me, that's just plain awesome. A lot like my home state of Minnesota, Alberta is full of lakes and rivers. And this part of Alberta is dominated by the Athabasca River. It's clear that from two days of hard hunting, unfortunately, the moose rut just hasn't kicked in yet. So Donald suggests that we use the waterways to help us cover more ground and hopefully, ultimately, help us find more moose. Success is gauged by the ability to adapt. And since we can't find any moose, we're adapting. The forest here is thick, and it's hard to travel on by land. But by water, we can cover a lot of ground that we would otherwise not have an opportunity to hunt if only by foot. And I have the best seat in the house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God for the beavers. They're very industrious and efficient at making push bowls. These beaver-made push poles come in handy because we've reached a part of the river where we see moose sign. And that means it's time to quietly drift with the motor off and listen and watch for movement on the shoreline. Now look at them, it's like we're in Italy. The only thing you need to do is start singing. Now, all joking aside, Donald knows this area and he knows it well. And as we come around the next bend, there, on the edge of the river, stood a cow moose, and we can only hope that she has a gentleman suitor nearby. Look behind her. Donald guides us in quietly. I've never been this close to a moose, and the peacefulness of the next few moments on that river that day will stick with me forever. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, because I was thinking it too. Why couldn't that have been a big 60-inch bull moose? But the truth is, if it had been, then I wouldn't have had this moment, these seconds, in this river. Life unfolds the way it's supposed to. Sometimes, we just need to be willing to drink it in. That is, without a doubt, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. And also one of the most spiritual and transcendental moments I've ever had in the woods. Silent, we snuck up. She didn't even care we were here. here, things are just different. I could try and explain it all day with superlatives like wonderful and unusual and exceptional, but really you just have to get out here yourself to understand it. Our next encounter on the river, much to my surprise, are these elk. Most hunters don't realize that in Alberta, there are a lot of elk. When most North American hunters think of elk, they think of places like Colorado and Utah and Montana and Wyoming. But here in Alberta, it's one of their best kept secrets. Elk numbers here have doubled in the last 10 years, and that means Alberta is producing more giant bulls than ever before. See, you learn something new every day. These cows and this young bull were putting on a pretty good show for us. And for no other reason other than just plain fun, I pulled out my cow call and started making all sorts of racket in an ill-fated attempt to try and get that young bull to make some sort of noise. The young bull had no interest in playing that game. But lucky for me, someone else did. We were surprised to hear a bugle in the distance upriver, and when we turned around, there stood this giant bull elk. Remember earlier when I said I had an elk tag but was going to wait for a moose? Well, I just changed my mind. Mm -hmm. 
This guy heard my calls and he came looking for love. I guess all that racket paid off because he saw the cows cross the river in front of us, so he crossed the river. I called some more and he kept coming. It was a perfect storm. The cows stayed close and we waited for him to pop out. I called more, but he never answered again. The light began to fade and we began to give up. In a Hail Mary, I called a few more times and then he steps out right in front of us. That just worked. What, what just happened? <laughs> we just saw some cows over here at a small bull an hour ago. And I started cow calling. Half a mile away, this bull comes all the way across, crosses the water, comes all the way over here, and I just smoked him at 80 yards. This is one of those moments that every hunter loves and hates. I just shot one of my best elk ever, and we had to get off the river because it's rocky and we don't have any lights, we're in a canoe. So, it's gonna be a long night. There's an old saying that says waiting is a means of acquiring patience. Well, whoever said that didn't have to impatiently wait for the sun to rise so they could go recover their first Alberta elk. We returned the next morning to track my bull, only to find out there wasn't much of a tracking job needed. Someday, <laughs> Are you kidding me? Holy moly. Thank you, buddy. Water could renew you. No matter how many animals you shoot in your life, and no matter how many pounds of meat you put in your freezer, there's always this moment of a little tinge of remorse, a little bit of respect and appreciation for this awesome animal in his life. But then there's also that kind of like, yeah, this is cool. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. The hell of a bull. Choices. We make them every day. As humans, we are creatures of habit. We most often take the easiest path, and we do the same things over and over again. I came to Alberta to hunt for my first bull moose, but when a bull of a different color stepped out, I made a choice that diverged from the original plan. And now, that choice has me on a river, in a canoe, tagged out on a huge Alberta bull elk. It's a beautiful moment that I will never forget as long as I live. And then, the next morning, I take a three-hour drive to the big city of Edmonton, and I find myself here. The Ellerslie Curling Club. Yep, I'm gonna try something new. Something out of my comfort zone. Something that I will probably suck at. Dixie Blackmore, D-I-X-I-E-B-L-A-C-K-M-O-R-E. -E. I'm Nick Hoffman. I approve Dixie's message. This is crazy. I've never stepped foot in a curling, is it an arena, a rink? It's a curling rink. It's a rink, so we're on the rink, but this is a curling club. It's a curling club because it's a club. Right. The ice surface is called the rink. Some people will call it the ice shed. Sure, like because they literally, especially back in the day, they were sheds, right? They were. It came from probably, what, 
years ice ago. Ice outside? And then had, yes, you started with on lakes or ponds or rivers, any frozen surface. Right. Curling is one of the world's oldest team sports. It originated in Scotland in the 16th century, and it was played in the winter on frozen ponds and locks, also known as lakes. Some of the earliest known curling stones came from Scotland and date from 1511, coming in at 44 pounds each. In the 1600s, stones with handles were introduced. Back home in the U.S., curling has always been dependent on frozen lakes and rivers until around 1881 when the first indoor arena was built in Boston, Massachusetts. So my grandfather did some curling. I know I don't remember him doing it, but I know that he did it in his younger days. It's, it's big in my area, but in Canada especially, this is a this is a major pastime for Canadians, right? It's a huge sport in Canada, yeah. yes. Um, if you haven't curled and you come from Canada, it's unusual, okay? <laughs> yeah. It's just what you do in the winter. Right. And when in Canada, do as the Canadians do. I meet up with Travis, a proud member of a new generation of curlers. Travis has agreed to be my teacher, but I fear he has no idea what he's getting himself into. We're gonna grab you a broom. Okay. Travis patiently explains that curling is played with two teams, and each team has four players. Each player takes a turn sliding a heavy polished granite stone, also called a rock, across the ice towards the house, which is a circular target marked on the ice. Each team has eight rocks, and each player throws two. While I was visiting Ellerslie, an Olympic team from Korea was there practicing. And after watching them, I'm thinking, this shouldn't be too hard. I mean, after all, I'm a pretty coordinated, athletic kind of guy. So I watch these guys, I watch this guy. It, lo it looks easy. It looks easy, but you'll find out, I think. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but yeah, so pretty much to start, you're just going to put that gripping foot uh -huh. into this hack. OK. This sport has special shoes. One shoe grips the ice, and the other is more like ice on ice. <laughs> I feel like a complete idiot. To get started, I place my grippy foot on the hack and get ready to push off. The name of the game is straight, level, balanced, and composed. I mean, how hard can it be? <laughs> uh, it was only a matter of time. The Olympic Committee in 1924 first introduced curling to the Olympics. Unfortunately, it didn't appear again in the future Olympics until 1998, and it's been in every single winter game since. Today, curling is very popular in our neck of the woods. In fact, in the US, there are over 180 curling clubs in 43 states. Right there, that's the equivalent of the Kobe Swish, where he turned around and just walked back to me like, that's how good I am. Remember at the beginning of the show when I said something about practice makes perfect? Yeah, forget I said that. Now, shooting the stone is only one part of the game. There is also sweeping. The idea behind sweeping is to steer the stone. By sweeping fast, you can heat up the ice and make the stone go faster. It also stops the stone from curling. And depending on how you sweep, you can also curve the stone to the left or to the right. And yes, that was my shot. And with a little teamwork from the sweepers, we just scored a big old point for Team Nick. Conquering the sport of curling is an art form. It takes the deepest of concentration for the shot. And of course, having grace on the ice with your footwork and hand motions are what makes a champion in this sport. Knowing when to sweep, where to sweep, and when not to sweep are the keys to winning. Finally, I got my try at sweeping. Keep going! And I'm here to tell you that it's just as hard as shooting the stone. In my case, it was probably harder, especially when you consider how out of shape I am. My first time sweeping, I did okay, right? I, I, almost, I almost fell. I like that you guys have good beer too. 
And now that I've made an ass out of myself in front of my new Canadian friends, we move upstairs to something that I'm much better at, and that is enjoying an ice cold beer. Curling rinks remind me a lot of the bowling alleys back home. Everybody gets together to enjoy the sport, and then everyone retires to the lounge to celebrate a victory or drown the sorrows of a loss. Either way, this is definitely part of the ritual, and I was more than happy to partake with my newfound friends, who, by the way, gave me a gift to commemorate my first time curling. A list of curling excuses, which I quickly put to good use. My best excuse, which is number four, I lost my balance with these new shoes. Balance. It's a struggle, but it should be part of everything we do. We need to be conscious of the choices we make to balance our time with friends, our time with work, our time with hobbies and adventure. I'll admit I struggle with that balance every day. Make the best of it. And if your heart is set on one thing and another opportunity is put in front of you, then you might want to change course and live in the moment. Take the new opportunity. I mean, after all, if I hadn't shot that elk, I might still be chasing a bull moose, which means I would have never made it to Ellerslie to learn a new sport and to meet new friends and try once again to prove that practice, hopefully, eventually, might make perfect. Who knows? If I practice curling enough when I get back home, then maybe, just maybe, someday, you might see Hoffman on the back of a jersey curling in the Olympics and then returning to Canada to celebrate with my new friends over an ice-cold Canadian beer. Sounds pretty perfect to me, eh? They call it the Sunshine State. And when I think of Florida, I think of vacation and tons of nice looking bikini babes out catching some rays. There's a lot of that here, but Florida also has a lot of something else that isn't afraid to show a little skin and is a lot less pretty. And they're called alligators. Beaches, orange juice, Disney, the great state of Florida is known for all sorts of things, but I'm not here for a healthy dose of vitamin C or Mickey Mouse. I'm here for its oldest resident, literally a living dinosaur who's been here for over 8 million years. I'm talking about the American alligator. So take a good look, because when it comes to my trip to Florida, I guarantee you that this is the last pretty thing that you're going to see. No matter who you are. He's coming in hot through the gap. You did a good job with that. I'm in South Central Florida, headed to the tiny town of Fort Meade. Fort Meade was named after the great Army Lieutenant George Meade, who served in Florida following the Second Seminole War. Future Confederate General Stonewall Jackson was stationed at the fort in 1851, and it was burned down by Union forces in 1864. Needless to say, Fort Meade is home to a lot of history. And this area is also home to a lot of alligators. And in these parts, nobody knows more about gators than Glenn Grizzaffy. Glenn and his family's entire life is centered around alligators. He commercially hunts wild alligators that he sells to restaurants. He participates in conservation and habitat restoration. And right here at his home, he has a huge no-kill gator farm, which is populated by rescued nuisance gators that otherwise would have been killed. And from those gators, he harvests eggs, which he sells to other farms. And I find out very quickly that Glenn's alligators eat a lot of food. I get all my gator food from fish houses. The aroma. Hey, what's that I smell? Oh, that's just fish heads. Glenn feeds around 1,100 alligators. There is 1,000 to 1,200 pounds of stinky fish in each one of these vats, and he goes through three or four of those vats every week. Do the math. That's pushing 5,000 pounds of nasty fish every seven days. In the summertime, gators are voracious eaters. This ferocious reptile will eat anything in sight, even little Fifi if you're not careful. In the wintertime, their feeding frenzy slows down to conserve energy. But lucky for me, it's the dog days of summer and the gators are hungry. This is unbelievable. They are everywhere. 
hundreds and hundreds of gators. Even though these are technically farm-raised gators that are on a 100-acre property here, look at how nervous they are. They're wild animals. And this is where Glenn told me to stand. I am literally 20 feet from about 500 gators. It's completely freaky because a few minutes while we've been talking, there's been no gator, and all of a sudden, like six just pop up right there. You have no idea they're there, which makes me never, ever want to go swimming in a brown piece of water ever again. This morning is my first time ever hunting for alligator. It's the end of July and the alligator babies are hatching. The young alligators make a very unique sound, one that cannibalistic male gators take full advantage of. They often locate the sound and eat the baby gators. And admittedly, I'm here to take advantage of that because by replicating that sound, you can call a big gator into bow range. Glenn helps me set up my bow with a heavy duty bow fishing rig, and I give it a test before we head out to hunt. Dead perfect, dead on 10 yards. Cool. Growing up with these dinosaurs all around you. You couldn't hunt them until 1988, but we grew up with them. We right. see them when we're out hunting turkeys and deer and everything, you know, yeah. and so you get used to them. As it went from the public water hunt in 88 to I did that and then processing, and then alligator farming, and then the kids are involved, you know, now. And, wow. And some people hunt for all, all the time, and they never saw a nine-footer. And my kids were on the cover of magazines with nine-footers at three years old. When a nuisance trapper shows up, we got it, we're gator trapping. You're not, your nine-year-old's like, yeah. no, 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 I'm good. We make our way to the banks of a small lake on the edge of a swamp. And I have to admit, I was a little bit nervous. I mean, let's be honest, these are wild alligators. This is an animal that can actually hunt meat. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all. Glenn starts to make baby alligator calls. Here he comes. And I was blown away at how quickly we saw our first gator. I'm just gonna go closer. Get ready to move if I tell you to. And it gets really real when Glenn says to you, get ready to move if I tell you to. That's the closest I've ever been to something that can kill me. And then almost immediately after that encounter, a gator comes out of nowhere and makes me realize just how dangerous this really is. He was fixing to come up the bank. He, was, he saw you. Did you see him look right at you? Yeah. I, I'm sorry. He, I, it would have been cool, but he could have bit one of us. I could have reached out and touched him. What am I doing? I have kids at home. spot close to where we hunted this morning that Glenn says is full of gators, which I trust because he almost got me killed this morning. <laughs> the first gator we see that afternoon is an absolute giant. And being the impatient person I am, Glenn's plan isn't something I wanted to hear. I don't think he's gonna come down here. Try and reposition. Well, leave him alone. I've learned through the years you'd never guide the guide. So the plan was to set up in another area and start calling. And maybe, just maybe, that big guy would come our way at sunset. Remember, these are wild and fair chase animals, and I couldn't believe how fast we were seeing gators. The first one Glenn called in came close. And I mean, almost too close for comfort. Like six feet away. Can you believe that? That's insane. <laughs> yep, that's me calling. And although I sounded like a hemorrhoidal walrus, I still managed to call this gator in. Just like deer hunting, we're looking for a mature animal, at least 10 feet long or bigger. We were absolutely surrounded in gators, from three footers up to borderline shooters. I was blown away at how many were coming to our calls. If you've never done this, you need to try this. We sat for several hours. It started to rain a little bit. And when the rain stopped and this rainbow popped out. There's four gators coming that I can see right now. That's when things started to get interesting. One, two, three, four. The closer to sunset we got, the bigger the gators got. And then all of a sudden, the giant that we saw earlier in the day appears out of thin air. The big one's almost here. 
That is the most intense thing I've maybe ever done in my life. We had a 12 plus foot gator five yards away, no shot. If we had had the call on that side, he'd have come. It's just a gamble. You don't know where they're coming from, you know? Unbelievable. That was potentially the most insane thing I've ever done. I mean, how many gators did we see? Well, we had eight called in at eight. one point. And then? And they were eight, nine, biggest. you know, seven to 10 foot. They were yeah, nice and gators. And then we had that giant in there. And two more feet. I was just about to draw back. He turns and looks at us and he goes. We hunt the next morning with no luck. And then in the afternoon, Glenn's Gator Farm gets a special delivery. A 10 year old female alligator. I got her. Nah, she's pretty feisty. You gotta calm down a little bit. When I tell you let her go, you let her go, okay? Until then, don't let her go. Ready? Go ahead and let her go. Love her. Give her a little bit of loving. <laughs> that didn't work very good, did it? Even though I'm standing here, she will always attack the side of the tail that's touching. Really? Watch. She gets to live here the rest of her life. The other option would be that somebody would just kill it, yeah. right? Most of the time, if the gator doesn't come to a farm, it always has to be euthanized and killed. She's 8, 10, 12 years old, probably. She'll live here for 50, 60 years, and for the next 25, 30 years, she'll make eggs. Eggs. That's what Glenn's place is all about. He doesn't hunt the alligators on his farm. What Glenn does here is grow gators and collect their eggs. And he's about to show me how he does it. And to do that, we need this. See the nest? There's a nest right there? Yeah, and it's a dirt nest with just some leaves and stuff, but there, and the eggs are gonna be half to two thirds the way down in that nest. I mean, she picked a great spot. It's hid, it's under the trees, it's under the vines. So where's mama at? If we're lucky, the scound of the boat, you know, scared her a little bit. I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't like that one bit. How'd you lose your music career, Nick? Well, uh, this guy named Glenn that's in Florida told me one time to fight off a gator, and uh, now I'm stubby. Give me just a second, I need to find us a stick here to guard with one actually perfect I walked right over it that's so, my job I I get the stick you get the short end of the stick on this deal because <laughs> I'm gonna be up here and you're gonna be standing guard but I the eggs have to be oriented we have to mark them I want you to watch the first time anyway but you're serious about the guard you're oh yeah you gotta have my back otherwise I can get bit so you just hit her in the mouth on top of the head and don't hurt her she's my girl <laughs> but keep her off me I'm a little freaked out to be honest with you she's probably big that makes you feel any better. Thanks. I feel like Gandalf, only without the beard. I also feel like this stick isn't gonna do a damn thing if a gator comes up here. All right, eggs have to stay oriented upward to where they were, how they were laid, so we're gonna mark it. Within 12 hours of the eggs being laid, the alligator embryo attaches to the eggshell and the babies grow in a circle. Their heads are up in the air pocket inside the egg. And if you turn the egg over, the baby gator will drown. Two weeks before they hatch, she'll leave the nest. Because they'll start chirping before they're ready to come out. Yeah. You'll hear them in the nest. If she hears them, she'll come up here and dig them out. And she'll wow. carry them one by one, gently. 80 teeth and 3,000 pounds per square inch. She'll never hurt one. And carry them right down under the water. Set them in the water. Every one of them. And then they'll stay with her for a year. We have 30 eggs right now. After collecting those eggs, we jump back in the airboat to find more nests and gather more eggs. And what happened next would only happen to me in the middle of a gator-infested swamp. My good friend Glenn here has run out of gas, which means we're carrying 41 eggs, alligator eggs, home in an alligator-infested swamp. Is this safe? No. <laughs> Great. Seriously? He says, don't go that way. After making it back with both of my legs intact, we leave the protected animals to chase after the wild ones. We head back to the same area that we saw Mr. 12-footer the day before. Glenn starts calling and immediately the gators come out in droves. Every direction I looked, I would catch sight of another alligator creeping in to investigate the baby alligator calls. So I have a conundrum. There is a giant gator, 12 foot plus, a couple hundred yards over there, kind of hung up. We have like a 10 foot gator, 75 yards and coming over here. 
And Glenn just says, what do you want to do? Bird in hand or giant gator in the bush? I think I'm going for broke. I'm probably going to regret it too. And then like magic, the big one appears. what you're thinking poor nick right well fear not because this story is far from over fast forward 45 minutes we've repositioned for another angle the sun has set and the 12 footer has again appeared right in front of us and once again he disappears only to resurface and swim right where i need him to be I let my arrow fly. Dude, are you kidding me? We stuck him, dude. 15 Come tries and... Oh my god. Oh my god. That's a monster. That's a monster. That's a monster. <gasps> Despite how excited I was, the hunt is far from over. Now we climb aboard a small boat to search for... Here's something in there. ...and retrieve this giant gator. Up there. That's a good sign. He's right down there. Holy look at that tail. There's a head. Watch out. Wait, shoot him. Shoot him. Because he is a monster. And I don't care where you shoot him as long as you get him in the boat. <sighs> yeah, push it down. Yeah. He's right at 12 foot. Hurry. God. I need to get that other leg up, don't I? We need a break. Are you kidding me? Watch these hooks. Yeah. 50 plus years old, older than all of us. I'm a species that's literally a dinosaur, eight million years old. If you don't feel a tinge of appreciation for that as a hunter, there's something wrong with you. This is an incredible animal. Fifty-eight miles west of where I just hunted my very first alligator is the big city of Tampa, Florida. And this is where you will find Charlie's Steakhouse. Charlie's is widely known as one of the best steakhouses in the US, but I'm not here for the steak. I'm here because at Charlie's, alligator is also on the menu. Charlie's Steakhouse gets its namesake from Mr. Charlie Woodsby. Throughout the 60s, Charlie and his partners were successful restaurant tours that had several different restaurants. Charlie and his partner, Bill Darden, had a vision to open an affordable yet elegant seafood restaurant. So in 1968, they opened a restaurant called Red Lobster. Within two years, five more Red Lobsters were opened throughout the Southeast. Then in 1970, General Mills purchased the Red Lobster brand. And we all know what happened next. Today, there are over 700 Red Lobster locations all over the world. And then in 1984, with a focus on high-end gourmet steaks, Charlie's Steakhouse was born. The executive chef here is Mr. Brian Fry. He'll be my tour guide on this gator tail culinary adventure. Today, Brian is showing us Charlie's Steakhouse's version of a Southern comfort food staple, deep fried gator bites. As an ingredient, as a meat, I mean, is there anything you can compare gator to? It is very unique and it has to be handled differently than a lot of meat. Some people say it tastes like chicken, very flavorful. We're gonna take the pieces here and lay them out. We don't want them to be too big because again, we don't want this to come off as chewy. The smaller bites are gonna take the marinade better is what you're saying. That is correct. Right. Now gator tail has a reputation for being a little bit tough. So ideally, these chunks need to marinate for at least 48 hours to give the citric acid enough time to break down the meat. 
and then after being tossed in a breading composed of white flour and a top secret blend of Charlie's special seasonings, these babies are ready for the fryer. This makes me feel like I'm working at McDonald's only in a really nice restaurant. Order fries for anyone? After being cooked to a golden brown deliciousness, the gator tail bites are plated over leafy greens, garnished with a lemon, and then served with Charlie's Steakhouse's famous creamy horseradish sauce. And voila, look at that. You have Charlie's Steakhouse's world famous gator bites. Tell me that doesn't look good. May I? Please do. I want to go for it too. Cheers. Gator cheers. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It is. And it's really tender. Like, you expect it to be tough because, I don't know, it's gator tail. Please enjoy. There's plenty there. I love it. Tastes like Florida. From now on, I don't think I'll ever look at Florida quite the same. We all know about the theme parks and the beaches and the nightlife. But this adventure reminds me that if you scratch the surface just a little bit, you might find an adventure that you never expected. In this case, one for an outdoorsman like me. A new experience that gave me the opportunity to hunt an animal that is literally a living dinosaur. One that understandably fascinates and scares people all at the same time. I learned so much from a man who not only loves to hunt these animals, but also, ironically, loves and cares for them and has saved so many that he will protect for the rest of their lives. The skin of these animals is tough, but what's under that skin is meat. And I'm talking really good meat. And so I leave Florida with a new appreciation and understanding of a creature that is truly remarkable and one that'll probably give me nightmares when I go to sleep. It doesn't have an ocean view, but it has views that are breathtaking. It doesn't have a fancy restaurant, but it does have a five-star chef. It doesn't have a dance club, but it does have a nightlife. It's the kind of place that takes you in and makes you feel welcome the first time you step through the door. It's plopped smack dab in the middle of country nowhere. And it's full of some of my favorite things like dogs and puppies and horses and birds and food and drink. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Alabama. Not your average quail hunting place. And I forget, did I already mention the puppies? There's something about a puppy that just makes a man happy. And talk like this. <laughs> makes a man just talk silly. Oh yes, I know. No matter who you are, so crazy, oh my god! No matter what you want your life to be, you're gonna be a star. He's coming in hot through the gap. Rolling like a VIP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're living like a rock star, baby. You did a good job with that. In 2011, the area around rural Ohatchee, Alabama was devastated by an F5 tornado. Homes, businesses, properties, cars, and lives were lost. One of those properties was owned by Frank and Jane Brown. And the two of them refused to let Mother Nature ruin their dreams. And in 2013, they began rebuilding Otter Creek Farms. And the end result is nothing short of amazing. The property has rolling fields and native grasses, creek bottoms, and open woods that make it a perfect location for wildlife to thrive. And today, Otter Creek has become one of Alabama's premier quail hunting destinations. After an evening arrival at Otter Creek, I meet Frank, Jane, and their staff, and I get a good chance to look around. And I'm not gonna lie, I like what I see. So this place is unbelievable. There's moments where you get to a place and you don't really know what to expect, and then there are places that make you say, wow, this is the latter. And to bring more wow moments into your life, I have to fill you in on some Alabama history. Cotton was the main driving economic force in the creation of the great state of Alabama. Cotton also created its two dominant labor systems, slavery in the Old South and sharecropping in the New South. This cotton-based economy produced cycles of boom and bust, resulting from the Civil War and from the infestation of the boll weevil. What is a boll weevil, you ask? It's a beetle and it feeds on cotton buds and flowers. It's thought to be a native of Mexico, and they reached Alabama in 1909, and by 1915, 
the boll weevil nearly bankrupted area cotton farmers and forced them to plant other crops, like peanuts, which was a huge hit. The peanut completely saved certain counties, especially Coffee County, where in just two short years, they became the biggest producer of peanuts in the U.S. Their residents were so grateful for their newfound peanut glory that they actually erected a monument on December 11, 1919 in the city center, which grandly proclaimed their thanks to the boll weevil. This was, and still is, the only monument celebrating an agricultural pest in the whole wide world. Congratulations, Mr. Bull Weevil. You did it. And so this evening here in Alabama at Otter Creek Lodge, I raise my glass to you. Cheers. Look at that. Cheers. That is unbelievable. This is the cigar room. For those of you that don't like to smoke cigars, you can stop right here. Remember that time I was in Alabama and I had muscles on a quail hunt? Are you kidding me? As we start to gear up to hunt on the first morning, I make a new buddy. Honestly, what is better than a puppy? Is my new friend. What you can't see is that I'm already trying to figure out in my head how I can talk my wife into letting me bring this guy home to Tennessee. There's nothing like the first morning of any hunt. I mean, everybody's excited. The guys are over here laughing. The dogs are all charged up. It's a beautiful morning. But as I look around here, I'm struck by how cool of a scene this is. Crazy machine here, and the dogs are in stainless steel boxes. It's like a perfect blend of the old and the new. And I love it, and I'm ready to go shoot some birds. There are six native species of quail in North America. The Mearns quail has the smallest range and is found in southern Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Mexico. The scaled quail, also known as the blue quail, are found in arid regions of the southwestern United States and into central Mexico. The Gambles quail or desert quail are located in dry regions of the southwestern United States. The mountain quail are only found in Washington, Oregon, California, and parts of Nevada. The California quail or valley quail live on the west coast and are California's state bird. The most common are the bobwhite quail, and they have the largest range of any game bird in North America, which makes them the most sought after game bird in the eastern and southern United States. Today in Alabama, we are hunting the bobwhite quail. Otter Creek runs a world-class kennel, and on this hunt, our birds will be pointed by Vishlas, German Shorthairs, and English Pointers. And rounding out the lineup on flushing duty is the lovable English Cocker Spaniel. I'm joined on this hunt by my good buddy Craig, and as we start to walk, it isn't long before the dogs go on point for the first time. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't expecting, I wasn't ready, I wasn't even expecting that. <laughs> Come on. I was like, I better shoot. Oh, there's one, there's one, Craig. There you go, Craig. Good shot, buddy. And a heel, heel. Oh, gosh, you won't. I better aim next time. <laughs> Good. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. And my first Alabama quail. It only took me two shots. <laughs> <laughs> they are everywhere. Took a leg off of that one too. <laughs> I can actually shoot. Proof positive. Wait, right here. Another point, right, another point right here. Yeah, get him. Get him. 
That a boy, Craig. Nice shot. Heel. At least he can shoot. You got one shot to give it all you got. Don't stop till you reach the top. Work hard, no punch the clock. Fast pace till it's finished shot. Right there. Time to claim your spot. <laughs> That's awesome. I hit that bird, didn't I? There you go. Look, you got time to watch. That's some action. I like it. Uh -huh. Stop and look, you got time to watch. There it is. You got one shot to give it all you got. Right through, no need to knock. No time for you to make a stop. But... <laughs> I don't even know what to say right now. This is one of the funnest days of my life. Come here, Merlin. Come here, buddy. Come here. Hey, come here. Good boy. <laughs> This is like Disneyland for bird hunters. <laughs>
is going to start to release itself from the vegetables. And that's going to thicken this sauce and thicken this dish and create that stewed consistency. Last but not least, pulled quail meat goes into the pot. And once it's all thickened up, Chef Finley serves it all over brown rice. Voila. Bada bread. That looks amazing. It's comfort food at its best. Right there. Cheers. Bon appetit. God bless Alabama. After lunch and a short nap, the crew heads back out to the field with a slightly different plan for the afternoon hunt. So we're changing it up a little bit today. This isn't normally how they do it here. They don't normally ride out on horseback, but since we've got a couple of extra friends here and they know that I like to ride, we're gonna go old school today. For all you that are worried about how dangerous it might be to shoot off of a horse, calm down. That's not how this happens. Nope, instead we follow the dogs and wait for them to go on point, and then we dismount and move in. You go for a nice ride. Bailey, find them. And I'm not afraid to admit that it's pretty nice to not have to walk. Get that bird. Good girl, come here, here. Good girl, drop it. Good girl. <laughs> There are zero things that make me more happy than watching a good dog work. And these cockers are so funny because they're like, they're literally like the munchkins of the dog world with about 70 times more energy. <laughs> zing, zing, zing. I love it. I want one. I want one of you. Well, one covey down. Let's go find another one. This is so much fun. Go get them. You know that, you know that moment where you, you're doing something you've never done before. Well, this is that moment. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's exactly what's happening. There's a first time for everything. And here in Ohachi, Alabama. Ah, nice shot. This is my first time hunting birds from horseback. This is definitely one of the funnest things I've ever done, but all good things, unfortunately, must come to an end. As you can see, it's pouring. This is our last covey of the day. Which is a good thing, because I think I have like two shells left. I've got a request. What's that? Chuck Berry, you want to be good? Okay. Mm -hmm. We celebrated a fantastic day of field with a little music, good drink, and an amazing dinner cooked by Chef Sean Finley. We decided to bring out the big gun. Mr. Frank here is joining us which really means that we're all gonna probably look like idiots. I doubt it. Because, I mean, just look at this guy. If no, it, nothing says experience like this right here. Muddy boots, blood covered chaps, and a really nice gun. <laughs> he doesn't even have anything to say. See, cause well, let's he knows, go have cause some fun. Because he, he knows I'm right, <laughs> that's why. Did you hear that? Frank's words weren't, let's go kill some birds. His words were, let's go have some fun. Those are wise words from a guy who's been there and done that, and words that all hunters should live by. Because in the end, that's what hunting is supposed to be all about. It really is all about the dogs. Yeah, I don't have to be shooting. I just enjoy going out and watching the dog work, and can't beat that right there. I mean, look at that. Mr. Frank's making me nervous. If you ask me, it shouldn't be about winning or losing or killing. It should be about having fun. Atta boy. 
<laughs> the old man can shoot. A good friend of mine once said that bird hunting is a good excuse to go for a long walk with your friends. And in this case, that means my new buddy Frank and these awesome dogs. I mean, who ever thought you and I'd be sitting here hunting together? True. I mean, after all, not many uh, sophisticated men like Frank will hunt with a hillbilly <laughs> Minnesotan like me. <laughs> well, something when you get when you get somebody from Minnesota and a redneck from Alabama, great things can come out of it. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I, for one, can tell you exactly what happens when you put a southern redneck and a northern redneck in the field together. Well, I'm a scratch on my second shot. <laughs> a little too close for comfort there. Lots of that fun we've been talking about. Ah, that was you, I think. <laughs> yes, there is. There's a, there's a dead bird right there. <laughs> he was pointing a, a wounded bird. Good boy. Got him. That was a heck of a shot. Well done, Mr. Frank. <laughs> well done. When I travel to a new place, I try to take mental pictures. The food, the laughs, the people, the hunt. Because those pictures, those memories, are often all we have to remember that new experience by. Cheers. For me, traveling is a bit like falling in love each time you go somewhere. Only usually, you have to leave your new love behind all too soon. Sometimes, sadly, never to see them again. And then every once in a while, you end up taking a piece of that place with you. Recently, on December 17, 1903, that Wilbur and Orville White made man's first sustained flights in an engine-driven airplane at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, in the United States. I have been infatuated with airplanes since I was a kid. I got my private pilot's license when I was 18. And that was definitely one of the most defining moments of my life. There is something truly indescribable about pulling your airplane out of the hangar, getting ready, and then turning the key and having it rumble to life all around you. But all that is nothing compared to the feeling of taking to the sky. As a kid growing up in Minnesota, I inherited my dad's love of two things, fishing and airplanes. Some of my favorite memories are being on the lake and going to air shows with my old man. And now that I'm kind of growing up, I still love the fish and I'm a licensed pilot. And those two things have brought me here to the beautiful beaches of the Panhandle of Florida. Because here they have world-class fishing and this is the home to the world famous US Navy Blue Angels. So welcome to Pensacola. No matter who you are. I find myself untangling knots all day. He's coming in hot through the gap. You did a good job with that. Pensacola is the westernmost city in the Florida Panhandle, resting 13 miles from the border of Alabama. Pensacola is nicknamed the City of Five Flags because of the five governments that have ruled here. Spain, France, Great Britain, the Confederate States of America, and the United States of America. Now, Pensacola has a lot to be proud of, but spend just a few minutes here, and it doesn't take long to figure out that they're proud of one thing in particular, and that is the Blue Angels. Since 1946, the Blue Angels have brought naval aviation to men and women of all ages across America. Their legendary performances are one big jaw-dropping display of American perfection and awesomeness. 
In 1955, the Blue Angels moved their home base here to Pensacola. And now, 64 years later, if you can believe it, they have invited me to ride along with them. But we'll get to that later, because there is a lot more to Pensacola than just fighter jets. This area is also a mecca for sport fishing, and I love to fish. So who better to go fishing with in the home of the Blue Angels than this guy, Brad Sowers, a Pensacola native and the proud owner and captain of this Blue Angels themed boat called Flight Risk. It's the first morning of fishing in Pensacola, and just like every day of fishing, I just find myself untangling knots all day long. Now before we fish, we have to fish for the bait that we'll be fishing with. Make sense? See, where I come from in Minnesota, we would just go to the bait store for bait. But I don't ask questions, we drop our lines in the water, and I have to tell you, it's kind of fun catching three or more of these things all at once. I'm just hoping we catch something a little bigger at some point. Eventually, the time came to fish for the real fish. You know what I mean. And while Brad caught the first two fish, I managed to catch part of one. Oh, look at that. Well, sorry, Mr. Snapper friend. Uh -oh. I, uh, sorry for your luck. Anybody who ever wonders if the sea is a nasty place, look at that. Don't feel too sorry for me because a few moments later, I landed a whole fish. Gold star for Nick. Not exactly what we're looking for. Look at those teeth. Do not put your finger in there. These are called trigger fish because you can't put, push this back unless you push that back. Won't let me do that, but it will let me do that. We are several miles offshore and fishing in about 100 feet of water. And just like hunting, for me, it's not all about the hunt, or in this case, the catch. It's about taking in the experience and the beauty that's happening around you. Like these dolphins that surfaced right next to the boat. And when we finally caught my first bigger fish, I figured out why they were so interested in us. There he is. Amberjack. All right. Yeah, big old reef donkey. Nice, man. Good job. <laughs> well, at least we're not scum. Success. The dolphin trying oh, to get a free dolphin meal. Right there. The dolphins have got that figured out, don't yeah, they? They come to the boat. He's harassing that fish. Yeah. Trying to eat. That's too big of a Yep, he got it. We were definitely catching and releasing fish like that. Sad to see the poor guy get eaten or harassed by a dolphin, but it's also really cool and also reminds us just how nasty of a place the ocean is. As the day went on, we caught big fish, little fish, red fish, brown fish. I even hooked into a shark that I fought for close to a half hour, which I'm not afraid to say kicked my butt. Or actually, it's a shark. It's a shark. Oh, oh he cut it off. Bit off. <laughs> right next to the boat. And then finally, we caught the kind of fish that we've been looking for all day. <laughs> Woo Look at him. That's what we've been after all day. I finally caught the big one. Proof that every dog has his day. And for me, you know what that means. Time for a beer. It's time to break out the angle cool. Cheers. After a great morning of fishing aboard the Flight Risk in Pensacola, Florida, Captain Brad Sowers and I crack a beer and sit down to talk about life in this part of the world. If you had to describe Pensacola in a couple things, what, what do you think of? You think of fishing, what else? Sugar sand beaches, and you get that sand in your toes and never comes out. You'll find it a year from now in your, in your flip-flop laces, you know, straps, you'll find <laughs> it. You can't get rid of it. Yeah. Pensacola has also got this naval base here that everybody knows about, and of course, that brings the blues, right? Yeah, every naval aviator passes through this town. You know, ever since I lived here, we lived within close proximity of the naval air station. I watched those Blue Angels from when they were F-4s, A-4s, and now F-18s. Right. Practice on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 11 and 11.30. Right over your house, probably. Right over my house. 
Having grown up around cornfields and lakes, it's hard for me to imagine growing up next to beaches and looking up and seeing fighter jets all the time. But to someone from Pensacola, that's just normal. To be a Blue Angel is to be part of a prestigious club of men and women who represent the absolute best of our American military. Kids like Brad and even some adults look up to a Blue Angel pilot as if he was a superhero. But there's a lot more to the Blue Angels than just pilots. There are dozens of men and women behind the scenes, filling all kinds of roles, ensuring that the mission goes off without a hitch. And this includes a contingent of U.S. Marines. They operate the venerable C-130 transport plane, who is affectionately nicknamed Fat Albert. The point here is that there are a lot of Blue Angels besides the demonstration pilots. And the people of Pensacola embrace them all like family. Even though the pilots change from year to year, people from Pensacola are bonded to the Blue Angels. So these Blue Angels, you watched them when you were growing up and they mean enough to you that you dedicated your whole boat to them. I mean, I've had people salute me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've had uh, people wave, whistle. It, it's neat. It was a dedication it's on neat. your end, but it turned into it, it, its own little thing. You're going to get the opportunity to go and I'm going to go out there to the tarmac and watch you fly <laughs> with the Blue Angels. And I'm a little bit jealous, but at the same time, I'm happy for you. And uh, Will you be jealous if I throw up? No, I want you to throw up. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Here's to that. <laughs> oh, I hope I don't throw up. <laughs> a.m. in Pensacola. I didn't sleep a wink last night. Why? Because today I'm flying in an F-18 fighter jet with the Blue Angels. Yep, you heard me correctly. I have been invited to fly with the Blue Angels. I literally can't keep from smiling. Which is the real life definition of a dream come true. Before I know it, I'm on the base. And then I meet my first guy that's all decked out in a legendary Blue Angels jumpsuit. His name is Lieutenant Commander David Gardner. And he's about to give me an inside look into a world that up till now would have only been part of my wildest dreams. Welcome to the Blue Angels. Thank you, this is incredible. The Blue Angels are the United States Navy's flight demonstration squadron, formed in 1946. In an average year, they perform over 60 precision shows in over 30 locations throughout the United States. The Blue Angels perform some of the most dangerous aerial maneuvers possible, often as little as 18 inches apart from each other. And they do all of this with the kind of precision that only the military can muster. To be named a Blue Angels pilot is one of the highest honors in all of aviation. As David shows me around their headquarters, I begin to get a sense of just how much pride and tradition accompanies the history of the Blue Angels. Pictures everywhere. There's a lot of history here, isn't there? Here you have 73 years of demonstration pilots. Literally the best of the best. We don't say we're the best of the best. What we say is that we're a representative slice from the Navy oh, yeah. and Marine okay. Corps team. And our job really is to represent everyone else who's out there doing the mission. Sure. But our team's 140 strong. Okay. So okay. there's a lot that goes on behind the to scenes. To support seven pilots. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of us behind the scenes action. Yeah. Everybody on this team applied to be here and was selected to be here. Right. And everybody will tell you about the pride that they feel in serving this unit. Yeah. And in just getting to, to do the mission, which is to represent the 800,000 active reserve and yeah. civilian members of today's U.S. Navy That's Marine awesome. Well, I'm proud to be here. This we're, is incredible. We're happy to have you, Nick. I'm in Pensacola. I'm about to fly with the Blue Angels. Yeah, that's it's actually happening. The U.S. Navy Blue Angels are an elite group of ambassadors for all of our armed forces and for all of America. Through their incredible demonstrations, they bring their rich history and tradition of excellence to an estimated 11 million people each year. The pilots in the blue jumpsuits also visit more than 50,000 people in schools, hospitals, and community functions throughout the cities they visit. Since 1946, the Blue Angels have flown for more than 505 million spectators. 
before I can fly with an angel in the sky, I first have to be briefed by Crew Chief Rob Weidershausen and to sign my life away. Believe it or not, this is the only uh, legal document I need you to fill out to fly on the back of an F-18. I've filled out longer ones to, to drive go-karts. On behalf of the United States of America, yada, 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 I release you from all claims of personal injury or death resulting from said flight. I'm okay with that. Honey, I love you. And now to get down to the important stuff. No, I'm not going to the bathroom. Get your head out of the gutter. It's Top Gun time. The time has come, and I'm introduced to my pilot, Lieutenant Carrie Rickoff, and together we step out onto the tarmac. God, nothing says God bless America like a bunch of Blue Angels F-18s lined up, does it? That's right. You must just still look at it and be like, this is amazing. Each day, it's, it's exciting every day. God bless America yeah. and the Blue Angels. Lieutenant Kerry Rickoff is from Atlanta, Georgia. He officially became a naval aviator when he got his wings in 2012. Since then, he's flown combat missions in Iraq and Syria, tallying up close to 200 aircraft carrier landings. So it's safe to say I'm in good hands. Did you always know you, you wanted to be a pilot? Or was it something that came out of nowhere? A little of both. Uh, I was always interested in flying. My right. uncle was a big civil civilian aviation guy, and he's the one who got me interested in flying, just kind of flying with him. Right. And so uh, initially took lessons on his plane in a Cessna. And everything just kind of snowballed from there. Found that out. One. Found out about the Navy, found out they would uh, pay you to go to college. <laughs> and I found out after college you go fly one of these things. So. Right. so it wasn't the Top Gun effect? It was a little bit of the Top Gun effect. Yeah, you'll absolutely. Admit it. You'll I, oh, admit absolutely. It. Watch that one too many times and <laughs> the Navy will get put in your brain. The Top Gun effect has gotten the best of me too. Because let me tell you, there are zero things that make you feel more like Tom Cruise or more like a badass than climbing up and getting strapped into an F A 18. And then the canopy closes and you realize. There is no turning back now. Have you ever sat in line for a roller coaster all excited, only to sit down and then think to yourself, what the hell am I doing? I'll admit that there was a little bit of that going on as we taxied away. At this point, I'm just hoping I don't puke. Once we're airborne, Lieutenant Rickoff tells me that his call sign is Chewy, as in Chewbacca, and I didn't even have time to ask why. Because the first thing Chewy did was make us pull six Gs, probably just to see if I'd fall apart, but I loved it. The next thing I knew, I was upside down. Over the next few minutes, we did all sorts of maneuvers. Upside down, straight up and down, upside down again. This is one of the greatest experiences of my life. A regular FA-18 that is used in combat can only fly upside down for around 10 seconds. But the Blue Angels jets have a modified inverted fuel pump that allows them to fly upside down for long periods of time. And Chewy is excited to show me just that. In the early days of aviation, people were afraid of what might happen to our bodies if we crossed 100, 200, 300 miles an hour. Maybe our bodies would just tear apart at those speeds. In October of 1947, both human and aviation limits were pushed to the extreme when Colonel Chuck Yeager traveled faster than the speed of sound for the first time in history. And now, it's my turn. In case you're wondering, 670 knots is nearly 800 miles an hour. Now that I've joined the Sonic Boom Club, Chewy starts to show me what this jet can really do.
Next, we go from 3,000 feet to 12,000 feet in less than 10 seconds. A g-force is a measure of gravitational acceleration. Standing on the Earth, we experience about 1 g. As g-force increases, it begins to force the blood downward out of your brain. The average human can handle about 5 g's before they pass out. We are about to experience the maximum g-load of this aircraft, the equivalent force downward of over six times your normal body weight. What? You didn't think I could make it through all of that without throwing up, did you? All good things at some point must come to an end. So, as a final hurrah, Chewie takes me on a high-speed pass along the beaches of Pensacola. And there, it hits me, just how lucky I am to be able to experience this moment. Below me is Pensacola, Florida. It's here that nearly every military pilot since World War II has learned to fly. And that military history affects the traditions of the locals as much as it does the people that are stationed here. This is a place where it's just a part of normal life to put your feet in the sand, a line in the water, and always keep an eye on the sky. Because you never know when you might see an angel. Well, on behalf of the team, the official photo that you uh, flew with the team, that's our 2019 litho over half dome. And all I had to do, one little tiny bag of puke, and I only passed out once. 